done. So, hello everyone, uh, I'm Tomasz Tomeczek, I'm working for Red Hat, and I would like to tell you something about Docker in production today. Uh, okay, so let's start, I mean, the title can be a little bit misleading, so let's start with like what this talk is not about. So, uh, it's not about existing success story, so I'm not going to tell you about how we deployed our application in production in containers and uh, I'm not going to talk about that. And also I'm not going to show you any production cluster or how it's running and I'm not going to do a demo about an update or a live update or something like that. So what, this, what the talk is actually about is uh, how you could run Docker in production, how you could like put your application into containers and run it in production. Uh, then when you do that, what you can expect from such an environment, from such a change. Uh, and finally, uh, I'll cover what's the current state of the art of Docker, like what's, what they are up to these days. Uh, so this means that this talk is about like how you can make your success stories. Uh, I'm, is anyone running Docker in production? Or Nice, so I hope you guys will do a uh, talk yourself someday, I would like to hear it. <laughs> uh, okay, so, and finally, I'll introduce myself. So this talk is presented by this guy, by me, and Tomasz. <laughs> uh, I'm not in operations, so I'm an engineer, so I usually do code, which then is being uh, held by operations. Uh, I'm also contributor to Docker project. Uh, I'm not contributing to Docker engine, but to other projects. Uh, and I really like containers. I mean, I'm interested in them in two years. And I, I'm running some of my applications in containers. So yeah, I, I like them. Uh, so let's start with the first section. And that's like steps needed uh, for using containers. Uh, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, this is the very simple workflow you need to do, like to run your application in containers. So first you need to take your application from its native form and put it into like container native form. So in this case, like Docker image, then you need to distribute the Docker image onto your nodes and finally deploy it to production. Like it's pretty easy. So uh, let's go through it. So before even you start building your uh, your Docker images, you first need to containerize the application. Uh, like another term could be like the package it into Docker or container native form. Uh, okay, so it means that you usually need to produce a Docker file, which is the uh, template how to package the application, or let's say it's like a recipe for building an application, uh, building a Docker image. Uh, it, and also, uh, that's not enough. Uh, like there's just an image, there's just file system with some metadata. So in order to make it a container, you need to figure out an arguments like how to run it. So for example, what volumes needs to be mounted, what environments variables need to be available in the container and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, this is usually easy. If you have like simple web application with, I don't know, with database and web service or some cache or something like that, this is fairly easy. You can learn this in like days and do this repeatedly. Uh, yeah, there are some cases when this is not easy, and the examples is like graphical applications. So for example, you can run your IDE inside container or your web browser, or for example, your application requires access to hardware or requires some special kernel modules or some special kernel features, and that's when not easy. Uh, this requires a lot of knowledge, like how the Linux works, how the daemons works, and uh, yeah, that's not easy. <laughs> Uh, okay, that's the first part of the build, like how to get to the point where we have the image. Uh, be before we can even assemble the image, uh, we need to pick a base image. So that's, that's the like minimal Linux environment uh, for your application. Uh, and I would like to stress out that content of the image really matters. So yesterday, Honza Horak had an excellent presentation about this. like. You need to pick base image which is like regularly updated, doesn't contain CVs, doesn't contain bugs, and it's not like something 
that someone posted on the internet is something that's really stable and you can use it in production. Uh, so now we have base image, now we have the recipe how to create the Docker image, so we can do that. Uh, yeah, this is easy. Well, <laughs> it might not be easy again, uh, because uh, this is done with a uh, Docker command, uh, with a uh, build subcommand, uh, and it has some issues, and some of these issues were not addressed in like one or two years, and the community still complains about it, and I mean, Docker sometimes tries to some do something about it, and sometimes they just ignore it. So let's take a look at some of these issues. So first thing is layer management. So when you have Docker file, uh, like with all the versions of Docker, every instruction in the Docker file produced one layer. So layer is just root file system and metadata. And these layers are, when, when you deploy a container, these layers are stacked onto them, and you have like the unified uh, view on the file system. So these are layers. Uh, and it's not usually what you want to produce a new layer for every uh, for every instruction, because then your image gets really beefy and it really takes a lot of time to start it and it actually affects performance. Uh, so community asks like, okay, so uh, Docker, we, we want new feature in your uh, in Docker engine and that's, uh, we want you to be able to squash layers. And it was like, I mean, issues and pull requests related to this were for like two or three years and none of them were merged or, but right now there is one, uh, it's being opened by a uh, Docker Inc. Uh, employee and it's possible that it might get merged. So let's say in Docker 1.13, we finally might be able to squash layers na natively. Uh, so what community ended up doing, they community figured our own tools for squashing. So there were some of them. Luckily there is one right now which is being developed by a uh, Red Hat employees called Docker Squash, and I, if if you need to squash layers, I uh, really advocate for this tool. Uh, okay, let's go to another issue, and that's build time secrets. So usually, uh, when you build or assemble your Docker image, uh, it's often that you need to access some external service and you need to authenticate with it, or let's say that or I'm, uh, by authenticate, I mean that uh, you need to have some password or some SSL certificate or S, uh, SSH keys to like get, to the, get, uh, get your sources inside the Docker image. So for example, git clone from a uh, repository which is behind uh, SSH. Uh, the thing is that this problem is not addressed. I mean, it's very easy to leave this uh, secrets into the final image and it's really hard to like uh, get the content from an authentication uh, authenticated resource inside the image so there are some best practices uh, how to do this but it's not like addressed still uh, and there is plenty of more issues uh, I had a talk dedicated to this problem on DevConf, so if you are interested you can watch it or you can reach out to me and I can discuss it with you after the talk, after this talk. Uh, and finally, uh, related to building images is image hierarchy. Usually when you have your application it's not like one container, it's usually several containers, or I know like 10 or 20, and that means that you need multiple images. Uh, and it's it's best practice to share as many layers as possible within your images. So this means that you need to create a hierarchy of your images. So you have like base image, let's say Fedora, and on top of it you have your own base image with some common packages installed. And to figure out this hierarchy, you need to like really think it through, spend some time on it, and like optimize it as much as possible. And it really takes time. It's not like you can do this like right now, like it's done. <laughs> uh, Okay, so we have our image built. Uh, so it's on one machine somewhere, and we need to get it to our nodes in our cluster, so we need to distribute it. There are many ways how to do that, and there's just one which is usually being done. So the first way how to do this is to like produce an archive of your image. You can do this with Docker. It uh, can like, get a single file representation of an image. 
uh, yeah, this is sometimes this is used, uh, but it's like uh, you you need to like automate it to the process of like uh, exporting the image and then getting it to cluster. So it's not used much, but it's a possible solution. Uh, the issue with this is that Docker usually changes the format of the archive. So if you like export the archive on Docker 1.8 and you import it on 1.10, it won't work. Sorry. Uh, so be aware of that. Uh, another, okay, so when, when I did this presentation in, internally a week ago, uh, so this item was like, oh, I wish it would be, if it would be possible to like share the images via shared storage. So you have it on one place and you just share it into a cluster and you don't need to care about like distribution and this kind of stuff. Uh, that was like, that would be nice RFE. And then yesterday I came to Danvo's talk and he uh, talked about this, that they are planning to do this. And I was really happy about it. Uh, so yeah, this is being worked on and in like a couple of months we'll see this. Uh, one comment for this is that it would be very nice if we could share the content uh, from Varlib Docker, where, where Docker stores all these images, to share it across the whole cluster, like, like the, all the layers. But unfortunately, it's not supported. Like some of the members of the community tried this, and the response was doc from Docker was that it's not supported. Sorry. Uh, so what's being used for distribution is actually the Docker registry protocol and their service. Uh, so it's called distribution, so it's in their repo and you can use it. Uh, the Docker engine client uh, speaks the protocol, so you don't need to even automate it or anything. It works. So the GH uh, domain is not saved. Yeah, but it wouldn't fit on the line then. But yeah, so, yeah, sorry about that. I, I expected that if I put GH that it would be obvious it's GitHub. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I can fix it. Uh, yeah, and finally, uh, when you start di distributing your images with the Docker registry, you need to figure out a naming scheme. So, for example, I advise to use like semantic versioning, so you know that th this image is alpha version, this is production image, uh, and if something fails, you know that you were using, let's say, like, uh, QA image, not production image, uh, and again, you need to spend some time on like figuring out the guidelines. Uh, and finally, we can finally deploy the uh, deploy the application. Yeah, this is the easiest one. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the most complex one actually. Uh, so let's start simply and we get to the more complex topics. Uh, so that version of Docker engine matters. So there are releases coming every, I mean, frequently, and it really matters what version you are using. I mean, the best thing is use the latest one, but what I mean by this is that specific release of Docker contains specific features and bugs. So whenever you are hitting a bug, uh, you can upgrade to newer version and hopefully it's fixed. And it's also possible there is a new set of bugs which will affect your application. So I really advise you to test with a specific version and ideally the latest one and hope that it's there, there are no issues for your application. Uh, if you have single node setup, if you have just one server running Docker and you have the, your application deployed there, it's the most uh, sim uh, simple scenario, but that's not very common. Usually you have multiple nodes, you have work cluster, and you have your application there, or even applications, uh, and that's really complex. So for that, you need an orchestrator or an orchestration system, which will take care of containers and and the, for the whole uh, application lifecycle of your application. Uh, yeah. That was <laughs> uh, so what can orchestrator do? Uh, I'll tell you in a second. But the important thing is that the orchestration system is like a new, whole new big service. It's not just Docker, it's also an orchestrator. And you need to like spend some time uh, for education for your uh, staff to learn it, to uh, see how it works uh, before even starting using it. So what it can do? So for example, orchestrator will figure out networking for you. You just need to set it up and then your application will have correct networking between multiple nodes. Uh, 
then there is storage. It's also like hard to figure out, but usually orchestrators uh, have solutions like how to do storage. Uh, rolling updates. When you update your application, you know, just you you tear it down and then you put it up, and you have uh, you don't have 100% uptime. That's usually not, you don't want to do. So orchestrators help rolling updates uh, and finally monitoring. Like some of them do have monitoring, some of them don't. But you also likely you also need to uh, use like your another type of monitoring, like Zabbix or something like that, to like check health of your application. Uh, okay, so that's for deployment and let's do a quick recap. So before even starting using containers, you need to establish a workflow like how to, uh, what the pipeline will look like from like build to distribute to deploy. Uh, then you, you also need to figure out base images like on top of which base image you want to stack your application. Uh, Usually part of the workflow is like CI CD, so before even thinking of putting something to production, you will you can test it in CI. So whenever you some of your uh, developers do a commit, you can put it to C, uh, CI and check uh, like if the builds are passing, and then you can easily uh, do CD on top of it. Some of the orchestrators even support this by default, so that's very nice. Uh, but you need to pick the correct one, so and that's not easy. I mean, you need to check what features are available, what requirements you have, and that takes time. Uh, okay, so we have containers in production, and let's see what can we expect from that. Let's start with the good. <laughs> uh, so we have unified environment. I mean, usually it was. I mean, in the past, the, it was pretty common that you have a team of developers and everyone is using something different. This one runs Linux, this one runs Windows, this one has Fedora, this one has Gentoo, and they use different versions of packages. And for example, what works for them on their machines doesn't work in production or doesn't work on a uh, machine of other developer. So with containers, they have all the same environment and you can be sure that if it works in their machines and in CI, it likely will work in production. Then everything is automated, everything is scripted, you don't need to like run scripts to do the release or something like that, it's just automated and it works. Uh, also it's tracked, so you know that when something fails in CI, uh, you can see what image ID it was, what version of application was in there, what uh, commits were part of the release, so you can easily check it. Uh, and you are in control of the whole system, hopefully. Uh, so in ideal world, you, all you need to do is just take your release, push it to version control system and just sit back and enjoy your build and, <laughs> and check the pipeline, how everything's smooth. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, let's continue with the bad expectations, what can happen. So this is the new type of infrastructure. So if you had like pre processes previously, tools and scripts, in place, this will usually not work for your uh, for the deployment with containers. Uh, also, you need new people to manage this or educate your former staff. Uh, and I would like to talk talk about this a bit more. So since containers, uh, I, I mean, are so popular right now, there are many releases in Docker or in I don't know OpenShift Kubernetes. So. Uh, these projects evolve very quickly, so you need to pay attention to what's going on in upstream and basically what features are being added and if you are interested in them, you can even like contribute to the projects and uh, polish them so it will work for you. Uh, and at the same time, there are also plenty new bugs being introduced and there are regressions in the releases and this is not something pleasant. Uh, and that what's also pretty common is that some of the issues are not very uh, not very easy to expose and uh, reproduce. For example, uh, there there was a bug in Docker that, for example, one in ten connections was like not established in your containers. And how would you uh, how would you resolve it or even reproduce like one of the ten? And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So. 
Okay, let's continue with the state of the art. Like, uh, what's the current state of the Docker ecosystem? Uh, so I'd like to start with this quote. Uh, it's by Solomon Hikes, and he said it on this year DockerCon, which happened, I mean, two months ago, uh, and it was on his keynote. He said that nobody cares about containers. And if you think about it, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's true. So what we care about is that we care about system, which is very easy to use, and we can use it for, deploying, for developing an application and deploying the application. So you have one system, it's easy to use, and you can use it for the whole life cycle of the application. And the containers are actually just an implementation detail. I mean, it could be done with virtual machines, and if, if the system would work, Fine, I mean, we would use it, right? Uh, so what Docker started doing, like two or three years ago, they're starting building like technology around containers. So they are uh, used, I mean, so they are easy to use, but over the time they figure out that it's just not enough, like they need to earn their money. Uh, so right now they are building whole platform, like whole platform for deploying, for, yeah, for deploying applications. Uh, and let's check the platform. So I think like three year, days ago, they finally released, they produced final release of Docker 1.12 and let's see what's inside. So the most like controversial big thing is that they, uh, they put orchestration inside Docker engine. So in the past Docker engine was like service which only could r run containers on your one machine, but since 1.12 is able to join the Swarm cluster and it's able to like run on, uh, on in the whole data center. So you don't need a special service for that, for the orchestration or for the mm, multi-host thing. Uh, so the good thing is that it's optional, you don't need to use it, and if you want to use it there won't be any overhead, so it's just that's just great, and it's also backwards compatible, so if you upgrade to 1.12, it's not like that it will break all your applications. Uh, with the orchestration comes the new API, it's called Service API, so in Docker there wasn't any, like, there wasn't uh, any elements for services, so you, you may know this from Kubernetes, there are like pods and services, and right now they are also in Docker, so service is basically composed of several containers. So you can basically have like HTTP service, and the service uh, and the containers itself might be running on multiple hosts, and they have also another primitives to. Uh, I mean, the service has another primitives like replicas and stuff like that. So this is also right now part of the engine, uh, and also finally, I mean. Docker also came with their own implementation of like multi-container applications. Uh, so it's called distribu distributed application bundle. Uh, like it's almost some like uh, Docker Compose. I mean, Docker Compose produces the up, uh, distributed application bundle. Uh, so and it's very similar to the Compose file format. Uh, okay, there's also a new instruction to Docker files. It's called help check and it uh, specifies a command you can use to check healthiness of your application. So if you have like web service, you can put curl there and can check if your application is responding or not. Uh, and then you can see the status of this in uh, Docker inspect. Uh, this one's very nice. So in the past when you restarted uh, Docker engine, it teared down all the containers and they were gone or they were just stopped. That's, that wasn't very pleasant. So with 1.12, there's a new daemon flag called Live Restore, and if you apply it, whenever you restart Docker Engine, it won't stop all the containers, so they will live happily, even uh, if you restart it, if you even restart daemon, so that's very nice. Uh, there was also split in packaging, so with 1.12, there's not just one Docker binary, there are now two binaries, so there is Docker binary, which is the client, and there is Docker D binary, which is the daemon. Uh, and what's great that Docker 1.12 is available in Fedora since I think yesterday. So if you have Fedora, you can, I, I mean, if you have Fedora Rawhide, you can try it out. 
Uh, I also mentioned some issues in past slides, so I would like to talk uh, about this a bit more. Uh, so, stability and issues. So, for 80% use cases, you it's very likely you won't hit any issues. And for some very specific use cases, like for, for some esoteric networking or storage, it's possible that you might hit something. Uh, for example, since Docker 1.10, uh, they put uh, a DNS server inside Docker engine, and since then there was there were multiple bugs related to DNS. And for example, I know that some community members were running uh, an application inside containers which were doing a lot of DNS requ requests, and they were hitting a lot of issues. So it's possible. Uh, there are also lots of code changes inside the releases. There, there, are, there are multiple pull requests flowing through the uh, project and they change a lot of code. So this means that it's not, I mean, there are, there are bugs inside these like code changes. You can see it in release notes. If you read release notes, there's like 10 new features and 50 fixes to bugs. Uh, so releases are done basically every two or three months. So usually when there is a bug, it's very, it's very common that it's fixed in next release or even next minor release, which is like a couple of weeks after a major one. So this is very good. Uh, and as I said, some of, the, some of the issues are hard to reproduce and even harder to fix. Uh, so here's a list of some interesting issues uh, I compiled from the issue tracker. So I'd like to go through it rather quickly. Uh, there is a name of the issue, I take it directly from GitHub, and then there is uh, issue ID. And so, so the list is split into several sections. So the first thing contains uh, some uh, race conditions. Uh, then there are some uh, issues related to DNS and connections. And then there are uh, issues related to graph backends, uh, namely overlay FS and device mapper. So I'd like to go through it quickly. So the first thing is uh, Docker daemon hangs under load. So this issue is, is open since June, uh, June 11, 2015, so it's more than one year. And the issue is about that there's a rate condition in Docker and some of the users were. So the issue is that, uh, that Docker stops responding. Like basically you do Docker PS and nothing happens. And the issue is open for more than one year. There were multiple like people commenting, I have the same thing and it's still not being fixed. So yeah, as I said, some of the issues are harder, hard to fix. Uh, then there is issues related to DNS because in 1.11, uh, they, they employed inside the uh, DNS server some rates. So for example, you could only do like 100 requests per second, and if your application does more, like they will be denied. So uh, some of the users were, is uh, were issues with that. Uh, then another, uh, then another uh, like area which is uh, has issues and they are easy to uh, interact is device mapper. I mean, there are issues with that. So. Uh, and finally, fuse overlay FS. I mean, it's really fast and really great, but it's not very stable. Uh, so for example, if you are using Python Packager uh, pip and you are using overlay backend, so if you install a Python package in lower layer and in the upper layer, if you try to update it, it won't work because the pip Packager will try to remove the previous installation, but since it's in the lower layer and you can remove it, uh, it will fail. So but I think that this is being fixed in kernel, so in new version kernels you shouldn't uh, encounter this. Uh, yeah, so this list is just, it's not so, it's not so hard to uh, encounter an issue with Docker or with containers. Uh, so this is basically the last slide of the presentation, it's summary. Uh, so for me, Docker engine has one containers. I mean, they developed and like, so they made using containers very easy and everyone loves it. So they have millions of users and billions of downloads of images. 
and they definitely want it. Uh, but the, what's, what's happening right now is battle for orchestration. So there are multiple orchestration systems and none of them is like one won the whole uh, market. So some of them are good for this, some of them are good for that, and the, the battle has just begun. Uh, and it's really up to you to pick your platform, what, uh, what suits your workflow the best. Uh, and before even doing that, I advise you to learn about the platform, learn about Docker, and pick what suits you best. Uh, so this is further reading, so if some of the issues or uh, topics I discussed di here are uh, described even further, so you can read it. Uh, and this is last slide, so uh, so that's a uh, link to my GitHub repo with the slides, so they are completely open source, and if you like to get in touch with me, that's my Twitter handle, and if you have any questions, uh, we have plenty of time to discuss anything. Yes? Uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, uh, you, you said that the, the one issue which uh, causes Docker to hang is open for more than one year. So, yes. well, for example, I, I encountered a similar issue and, I, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe something's wrong with the Docker daemon itself, so it's not my application, but the Docker daemon mm -hmm. itself. I decide to file an issue on GitHub. How can I help them to resolve it uh, quickly? I mean, can I take the core dump of Docker daemon? Is that, is that useful? Do I have tools to analyze the core dump, for example? So I see like go routines at, or state of channels, what, what messages are in use, or are there any tools for debugging like big Golang applications in production? If you, because if you are deploying stuff into production, you should be able to debug the stuff. Mm -hmm. And in case that your application depends on uh, Docker, because Docker runs your application, and you encounter such a bug, what, what, what are, what is, what's the story there? I mean, what mm -hmm. can you do to, to file a meaningful issue? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I was actually thinking of putting a line how to do that or what could help, but I haven't. So I'm glad you asked. So I won't answer for the whole Golang because I don't do Golang and I don't know. Uh, and for Docker specifically, so what you can do is that whenever you encounter an issue and you would like to send Docker like some meaningful data which they can use to analyze the issue and fix it, you. Uh, first thing that you should run Docker in debug mode, which is just Docker daemon dash capital D. And the second thing is that you can send SIG user one signal to the Docker daemon, and then it will respond with the whole trace of all Go routines. So yeah, there will be stack trace of all Go routines, and then they can use it to analyze the issue and, and ideally fix it. Production plans, uh, Docker in production. So, uh, what's your uh, take on uh, you know, mixing the Ansible with Docker and the point? What was the state of the process? Um, Docker and Ansible. Uh, yeah, so you know, build the images and deploy it, you know, multiplayer using different uh, projects. So, uh, so I know that in Red Hat, uh, like, there was a new Ansible release like a couple of weeks or months ago. And it it had some like improvements in case of Docker, so there are some new Ansible modules for that. Uh, so I mean, you can use that uh, to basically. Uh, I mean, the modules are able to like create the Docker image without Docker file, so you can use an Ansible playbook to create a Docker image, which is really great. And then you can use another Ansible module to deploy it basically. So. I haven't tried it much. I mean, I played with it. What it was working, I liked it. But I haven't used it in like production or extensively, so I can comment on that. Uh, does it answer your question? Or yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes, please. So uh, one common thing I've heard from a lot of people um, about Docker production is a lot of like that. 
essentially give a full base like a lottery because it's something that is uh, done by a few people and some people have success. But what we're seeing here is that there are a lot, of, a lot of possibilities to do that if you're willing to deal with a lot of the issues. So it sounds similar to what I've heard from many people. So uh, the question is, is the Docker community in general or the Docker developers trying to make it something for production? Is that their goal? Or is this something that was sort of happening as a side effect of current development? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's good question, and uh, I. Okay, so I feel like they are trying to push for Docker in production, like running containers in production. Basically, when you go to DockerCon, usually one of the first questions to the audience is who is who is using Docker for development. So basically, the whole audience. Raises their hand, and second question is who is using in production? And for example, every year there is more hands being uh, like uh, put up. Uh, I feel like that with latest releases they are trying to go for containers in production. Uh, but I mean, as the time goes, it, uh, it feels like that the platform is more stable, so there are more bugs being fixed, and so I feel like that it's. Stable with more stable with every release, but it's it. I mean, that's not really an answer to your question, and uh, I I don't feel like how, how could I answer it? It's like uh, well, it's more so just um, um, in the development community of of, um, of Docker, if they have so the official goal is we want something that can be used in development and in production, or if their official goal is we want something that can be used in development and if it can be used in production, that's a good side effect. I'm not really sure if, if Docker, uh, if they actually have that as one of their tools to be a production ready system. Yeah, yeah. instead of 1.0, they claim that they wanted to be. They claim 1.0 is production ready. Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. And that was like two years ago, so <laughs> the, it should be even more production today. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like, there, there are very large, like, Fortune 500 companies running Docker production at scale. Done. Yeah. I yeah, yes please. So since we're talking about the ready production, what's the correct way of backupping data inside some container, for example, some databases? Uh okay so uh so ideally you have the database da data uh, in a volume and you can pick a volume plugin to ma manage it. So it can be like on the file system or it can be on Gluster or some shared file system. So the definitely the best thing is to put it on volume and ideally have the volume being backed up and on some shared storage or some like enterprise storage. Yeah, but I don't think that putting my SQL in a Gluster is good for performance. Yeah, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm not operation, so uh, I, I don't know, but my, my suggestion is put it on volume and Pick the correct volume plugin and store it in there. So definitely don't put the database data ins inside the console. <coughs> uh, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, so I have tried using system in spawn. System in spawn? Yeah. What's your opinion on that? I've been using that for a few years now, and I'm production we've been using it for a and a half year. And honestly, uh, I was loved. I I, mean, I fell in love with Docker three years ago, but the time passes and since uh, maybe one and a half year, I'm getting more angry and more angry because from basic container engine, it started to be a, a full shipyard. Yeah. And the stability is getting lower and lower, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, when we use it in production, we had we had to learn by heart uh, what not to do, uh, and then we know how to use that uh, uh, in the stable uh, manner. So uh, we started to feed and to test system DS form, which is basically a, a very tiny blo block without any networking in storage, etc. And it actually looks to work perfectly right now. And we are in this situation where we're trying to think about what to do next. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm glad you shared your experience. Uh, 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 I 
basically I don't have any opinion of of Unspawn. I mean, I'm I, I think that these two guys really appreciate your feedback because they they are working on System D and they are part of System D upstream, so maybe they could answer your question better. Uh, but I'm not sure if he recommends using Unspawn uh, in the month that there is uh, he doesn't. I thought about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't, but it works. <laughs> hey, but, but there is uh, no basically, it's certainly uh, basically important because the original use for that was just the system view. Because if you write a lot of things in system view, if you run it on your computer, you will break it. If you run it in the virtual machine, it's just clumsy. So, so it was designed to, to test system view. But that's, well, it, it stops the name name spaces and C groups, and that, that's all it does. And maybe that's all you need. So, exactly. But that's definitely interesting feedback. Uh, also, as Dan Walsh talked about his presentation yesterday, they are also planning to like not use Docker for running containers. They are planning to use Run C and on top of that, build a simple service which will babysit the containers and that's it. So, so uh, I totally uh, understand that something, some similar service for running containers works for you better than the full-blown Docker. So when I have another container, I will run it uh, 50 times, the small one, not, not, not doing that thing. It's a special, like, it's also one for uh, which version would you recommend? <laughs> the latest one, or is there a really stable version that you consider most stable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a tricky question, because it really depends what you want to achieve. I mean, if you require, if you, if you need the latest features, then definitely the latest then feature. You know that it's heavy. Uh -huh. Uh, okay, so I mean, uh, <laughs> as, I, as I said, it's a tricky question. Uh, for example, I would definitely go for what's the latest release inside the distribution. So, for example, in Fedora or Rel. So, yeah, that's, that's stable and you can use it easily. Yes? yes? Do you know maybe if Python API is stable now? Uh, I was uh, trying a and it was quite difficult to find the correct documentation in the Docker uh, with the docs page, I think. Uh, pardon me, what was the name of the project? What? Uh, the name of the project you mentioned, I misheard. Docker. I'm yeah. talking about uh, Docker Python API. Aha, Docker Py, yeah. Uh, do you know it's stable or not right now? Uh, it, it's, it differs every subversion, minor version. Yeah, we had the same issues. Basically, when we used like an older version, it wasn't working for us. Then we had to upgrade to newest version. And I feel like that with the latest releases, it's being it's pretty stable. And they are also following. Uh, so whenever, so whenever they uh, like put a new feature inside Docker, Docker Pi, uh, they basically uh, okay. What's it called? So they use deprecations and stuff like that. So whenever you use something which is deprecated, they warn you. And at the same time, uh, you'll see that this feature can be used with this version of Docker engine. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like the latest releases are pretty stable. And uh, I'm actually using it in one of my projects. And it's, it's working well. Okay, so the, the problem is the Docker API seems to get like re-specified every so it will be stable for a while until they deprecate it. And they do give you warning, but then in three months it's gone. Um, so grain of salt. Yeah. So Is that, I don't know if that translates to grain of salt. 
Well, for, for anyone. Anyways, doesn't matter. The point is, um, like, there's been, like, Docker's existed for like three years. I think it redesigned their API six times. Well, um, you, you can So it was version one, and then 1.1, one, and then 1.2, and then v2 happened, and then when v2 happened, there were two iterations of that, and not compatible. So, yeah, I mean, yes, the, the library is stable in the sense that they don't break it, but they get changes often. So, so I mean, the good thing about, about their API is that they version it. So, for example, right now there's like version 23, yep. and you can pick the specific version and it will work. So you can even do this with Docker Pi. You say that I'm interested in version 1.20, and you can use it, I think, forever. Uh, but Adam is right that yeah, they are they are changing the implementation details and structure and stuff like that often, and it's some it's something that you shouldn't rely on, like on their their internals. But the API, yeah, is being changed often. Yeah, I asked because I need a backup of help. Because uh, the API was not the same as documentation set, so yeah, that's pretty common. So that's, that's yeah, that's, <laughs> that's common. Actually, I have I have um, I have commits in Docker purely because of documentation. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I had the same problem. I, I wrote something to to documentation and it blew up, and so I traced down why. And yeah, so the only reason I even remotely have patches in there is because I I tend to fix docs a little bit. But but I sorry Michael. Uh, but whenever I hit this issue, I go to the API documentation of Docker itself, and usually it's. I mean, I haven't found any like uh, anything there, any issues. So I use that one, not the API documentation from Docker Pi, or I browse the sources of the Docker engine if there's really something wrong. I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, Michael? Uh, okay. I just. Installed Docker uh, 1.12, uh, and I just noticed that RPM is like 120 max. Yes. And with the dependencies, it was 140 max. I mean, system D package was 11 max, and people were like bashing us that it's still too, too big, 11 max. And it, it has 140 max, it's bigger than the Docker now, I think. So, so Golang go and step the links, and they bundle everything, and now they bundle Swarm in there. It, like they took like all these new projects and just threw it together. But we have a lot of like going in the Docker, right? Yeah, we do. Um, but they're not dynamically linked. It's all it's, mm -hmm. so when you do the depth chain, it just pulls it into the build root so that it statically links them to the to the binary. Mm -hmm. the, bi the binary is static; it can run. Yeah, yeah. But it's. I mean, it's, like in the end, it's native code, right? right? Yeah. But, but the tool chain do what? We don't ship. Thank you. 